Here on Federal Workforce, Postal Service and the District of Columbia will come to order. Uh, the chairman will return shortly. Meanwhile, I want to welcome the ranking member, Mr. Kaf Mr. Schaefers, uh, members of the subcommittee, hearing witnesses, and all of those attending today. Today's hearing is intended to discuss the Postal Service's recently proposed initiative to study the activities of nearly 3,200 postal stations and branches across the country for consolidation purposes, as well as to examine the, the Postal Service's cost-cutting and consolidation-related efforts, including mail delivery, route adjustments, and related impacts. The chair, ranking member, and subcommittee members will each have five minutes to make opening statements, and all members will have three days to submit statements for the record. This time, I would like to ask unanimous consent that the Congressional Research Services July 23, 2009 report on postal retail uh, facility closures be entered into the record hearing no objection, so ordered. Ladies and gentlemen, today's hearing comes on the heels of the Postal Service, uh, as you may have read, uh, being placed on the Government Accounting Office's 2009 high-risk list, which is largely due to the service's bis abysmal financial condition, an issue this subcommittee has followed closely. But even before the Postal Service returned uh, to GAO's high-risk list, alarms had already sounded regarding the Postal Service's revenue-generating problems. For the first time in decades, the organization reported a net loss of over $2 billion for fiscal year 2008. Losses for this year may exceed $7 billion. Despite the Postal Service targeting of $6.1 billion in cuts. While we may be unable to pinpoint whether the recent economic downturn, the steady diversion of mail to other mediums, or a combination or uh, both uh, is to blame for the current troubles, what we do know is that mail volume has dropped precipitously from roughly 213 billion pieces in FY 2007 to a total of 203 billion pieces in 2008, and projections for this year indicate that the volume will continue to fall by possibly 28 billion pieces to a total low of 175 billion pieces. The writings uh, the writing is on the wall, and the Postal Service obviously has to make some tough decisions if it expects to weather this current storm. These decisions may involve more across-the-board cuts and work hour reductions, as well as accelerated consolidations of facilities and operations, which brings us to the subject of today's proceeding. Making sense of it all, an examination of UPS has recently proposed station and branch optimization initiative. Although at first glance, the initiative seems to s simply be the latest step in the Postal Service's multi-pronged effort to reduce its costs by removing excess network capacity, we all know that the devil is in the details, and that's what we're here to find out uh, this morning. It is critically important that even in the preliminary phases of studying the consolidation of nearly 3,200 station and branch locations, we all have some level of understanding about the potential impact such changes could have on costs. Perhaps more importantly, we need to understand what effect these proposed changes may have on postal customers, committed employees, and communities in general. To that end, 
Today's oversight hearing has been convened. The subcommittee is interested in having the Postal Service fully articulate its recently proposed station and branch consolidation initiative. Today's hearing also is intended to take an in-depth look at the Postal Service's efforts to achieve greater delivery efficiency through the adjustment of letter carrier routes. This subcommittee looks forward to learning more about route adjustments, the impacts associated with these changes and the savings achieved from these actions. It is my hope that the testimony and feedback we receive from today's witnesses will allow us to gain that knowledge. Again, I thank each of you for being with us this morning and I look forward to your participation. I'm now happy to yield to the ranking member Mr. Chaffetz for five minutes to make his opening station. Thank you, Madam Chair. I, appreci I appreciate it. On June 24th, the subcommittee amended and marked up H.R. 22, allowing the United States Postal Service to adjust required payments to future retiree health benefits. The full com committee adopted our approach by marking up the bill on July 10th. To this date, it's still very disappointing that the Democrats have chosen not to bring up this bill to the floor with such broad bipartisan support. The United States Postal Service correctly advised us at the time that the legislation, while substantial, would not completely resolve all of their financial issues. That has certainly turned out to be the case. Just this week, the GAO announced that the United States Postal Service would be designated as, quote, high risk. This is sobering news. 2006, the Postal Accountability and Enhancement Act was passed in part to help get the Postal Service off the high risk list, which it did. Thus, GAO's renewed designation sh should serve as another powerful reason for Congress to act and to act quickly in passing H.R. 22 and any other legislation which will help get the Postal Service out of the financial swamp it now finds itself in. Consolidating branches is an important and complex con consolidation can best take place on the merits for the system to work. A primary reason the Postal Service is in trouble right now is because it lacks some of the flexibility to adapt in a changing environment. The United States Postal Service has experienced the largest drop-off in mail volume in its 234-year history, greater than the declines during the Great Depression. A number of, value, uh, of major mailers are in financial uh, straits. Bulk mail volume and advertising mail is down. This is due in part to the poor state of the economy, and also the postal monopoly does not extend to email and Internet advertising, which continues to grow. The forecasts for the return of these volumes are not optimistic. The Postal Service must right-size itself to the market it serves. When looking to make cuts and finding long-term solutions, one must evaluate the entire operation of the Postal Service. I look forward to discussing the rearranging of delivery routes and other potential structural changes, but even that is not a complete solution. One of the changes being pondered is an exigency rate increase of 2.4 percent to be established, quote, only when justified by exceptional or extraordinary circumstances, end quote. But raising the price of an item will only reduce sales, in my opinion, not increase them, especially when demand is clearly decreasing. Thus, the rate increases appear to counter to, uh, seem appear counter to any sound economic logic and will only serve to further complicate the St United States Postal Service's woeful financial circumstances. I will not support, nor do I believe, we need a rate increase on, on postage stamps. There are those who suggest that the Postal Service is a dinosaur living in a modern world. It is certainly a paper-based, labor-intensive service at a time when most Americans are more and more comfortable with email and Internet communication. However, the Postal Service remains essential, vital, and one of a constitutional imperative. I think the, in my own personal opinion, I think the Postal Service as a whole has done uh, a very substantial amount of work to decrease the cost associated with it. Not only do we need to look at cutting the cost, but we also need to look about how to make Postal Service more relevant in the modern world. It is a vital to our communities. It is vital uh, to business interests. And I think we all support and want to see the Postal Service thrive. I know that's why the gentleman or representative is, is here today. I, one thing that I would hope that we would explore, Madam Chair, with the uh, discussion today is the difference between the rural components and the urban components. Because there are factors that are distinctly different in the rural areas, for instance, in my district, than some of the urban, urban issues. And uh, I want to make sure that we explore those in the discussions today. And with that, I'll yield back. I thank the ranking member. Are there 
Uh, other members of the committee who wish to make an opening statement? Uh, Mr. Conley. I thank uh, the chair lady and I thank Chairman Lynch for holding this hearing. I'm afraid the Postal Service leadership has leapt to the conclusion that the only way to keep the Postal Service solvent in addition to passing H.R. 22 is to cut back on hours and even days of operation. I believe that any short-term steps must be taken in the context of consideration of the long-term business model for the Postal Service. Short-term cuts in service will have long-term impacts on utilization of the Postal Service. We must learn how the Post Service intends to remain solvent during future cycles of economic growth and contraction. Cuts in hours of service for post offices represent a major loss of service for Northern Virginians, for example. Without operating in the evening, most residents are not able to use their post office due to the length of commutes in our region. In fact, Bristol, Prince William County had the longest commute in the United States. Unfortunately, changes in hours have been executed in the past without coordination or even notification of elected officials. This examination is particularly important in light of GAO's recommendation that USPS consider restructuring to address its current and long-term financial viability. Efficiencies that can be derived without loss of service or jobs should be considered first before employees or consumers are asked to make those sacrifices. The Postal Service should identify all the savings that can be realized through area mail processing consolidations and network distribution center closures and make every possible effort to avoid layoffs associated with those closures. I appreciate the opportunity, Madam Chairwoman, uh, to explore these issues and look forward to hearing about the protections Postal Service must employ to protect our consumers and their employees. In the final analysis, however, USPS must move to a new business model one that takes cognizance of vigorous competition and the impacts of technology on the traditional rain, snow, sleet, or hail model that has provided exemplary service to the Republic for over two centuries. I thank you and yield back. Thank you, Mr. Conley. Uh, Mr. Kucinich. I uh, thank the gentlelady. I'm a strong supporter of the Post Office. And I'm deeply concerned about the uh, USPS's financial condition. And I appreciate the uh, magnitude of the task that's ahead for the uh, Postal Service to ensure that it continues to be a Postal Service. Uh, as uh, on July the 16th, the Postal Service announced 16 post office branches in the greater Cleveland area would be reviewed for possible consolidation. After reading the testimony and the GAO report for this hearing and after hearing from my constituents, I have many concerns. I'm concerned that final decisions regarding each branch under consideration for consolidation will be made without full community participation and input. I'm concerned that people in my community and communities across the country will face a significant and unnecessary reduction in access to crucial services. I have concerns about the private sector taking over services that these facilities provide, because privatization of a public need like the Postal Service would be a disaster. And I think this committee ought to be very uh, wary of privatization being an undercurrent in the post office. And I can tell you, as chairman of the Domestic Policy Subcommittee, uh, the general po uh, topic of privatization is something that uh, we're looking into. Uh, I, I'm I just want to say that this review process has to be done at the local level and must consider the unique demands on each individual facility to ensure that the concerns of the community, customers, postal workers, and the effects on a local economy are fully considered. Um, Madam Chair, uh, beyond, beyond the serious local concerns that I have about Cleveland, look what's happening in our country right now. You know, over the last few decades, we've seen a deindustrialization. Insurance redlining, mortgage redlining, the subprime loan fiascos, the foreclosures, bankruptcies, high unemployment, business closings, even churches and schools closing. And you look at the communities that are affected the most. They're exactly the communities that have the highest need for postal service. Start closing some of these branches, you're talking about cre you know, creating ghost towns.
You know, I, I, I have concern about the finance of the post office, but it's very interesting. When you talk about maintaining universal postal service, which is really a right in a democratic society, you get people say, well, how are you going to pay for it? Where was that question when the TARP came out? How are you going to pay for it? $700 billion thrown away to Wall Street. Trillions of dollars given to big banks. Banks parking money right now at the Fed. Fed paying banks money to not to loan money to businesses in our community. How are you going to pay for it? $3 trillion at least. How are you going to pay for it? No one really asks that question. When it's postal service, something that everyone uses, how are you going to pay for it? It's the same kind of crummy debate that's going on right now over universal health care where the insurance companies are hovering over Washington like a flock of vultures just waiting to see what they can pick up from the taxpayers. How are you going to pay for it? If we are committed to universality of service, then we're going to take a stand on behalf of the post office. If we're considered, if we are committed to universality of service, and we're going to take a stand on behalf of postal retirees, who the U.S. Postal Service right now is looking at cutting into their retirement benefits. If we're going to take a stand on behalf of universal service, then we have to do it and challenge uh, uh, those who somehow believe that uh, if, uh, if the government has to uh, pick up an increased cost here, that somehow uh, that's anathema. Well, we have to ask, what's a government for? Is it just for war? It's just for being a gas station for wealthy special interest groups? Or are we a government of the people, as Lincoln prayed? We're about to find out. Chair, now recognize the gentleman from Maryland, Mr. Cummings. Mr. Chairman, I want to hear the witnesses, and I will associate myself with my colleagues' uh, statements. And with that, I yield back. Okay. Chair, recognize the gentleman from California, Mr. Bilbray. Yes, Mr. Chairman, in the spirit of transparency, I want to uh, admit and announce that, yes, uh, the, the James Bilbray on the Postal Commission is my first cousin, uh, the former House member, as the, uh, the uh, delegate knows. Um, but I have to sort of reflect, um, uh, again, with my colleague from Cleveland, that there's a whole lot of things this town does and a whole lot of money that the federal government spends that has no nexus to, a, to the constitutional responsibilities. Postal service is one that is specifically enumerated in the Constitution. It's specifically a responsibility solely of the federal government. Um, it is not an incursion onto states or local rights. It is not an expansion beyond the Founding Fathers' intention for us to maintain and enhance the postal service. And so I think this is one place that uh, Republicans and Democrats should finally find the uh, uh, middle ground we can, uh, we can cooperate and agree on. So I yield back. I thank the gentleman. Uh, in, in full disclosure as well, I have mentioned this on numerous occasions, but I think at last count I have 17 members in my family, extended family, cousins, in-laws, uncles, aunts, sisters, mom, uh, who are either actively working for the post office or are our retirees. So uh, that much being said, I want to welcome, it gives me great pleasure to welcome Representative Albio Sires from New Jersey, who was a sponsor of a piece of legislation that is, is coming before the committee that he has, that he has sponsored. And I want to recognize him for, uh, for five minutes. Actually, it is the custom of this committee to uh, swear witnesses who are to provide testimony before it. So could I please ask you to stand and raise your right hand? Do you swear that the testimony you're about to give to this subcommittee is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Let the record reflect that the gentleman has answered in the affirmative. And the gentleman is recognized. But you know better, right? Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member, members of the subcommittee. Thank you for allowing me to testify before you today regarding my experience with a post office closing in my district and the need to properly inform and involve the public in the closing process. 
I am very concerned about the Postal Service's recent announcement to consider closing more than 3,000 retail post offices. I understand that the Postal Service's financial problems are daunting. I know they're having problems operating, but no amount of financial stress should relieve them from providing a transparent closing process with significant community involvement. Post offices are an important part of the communities. I witnessed this firsthand. My experience with the closing of a postal service in, in the Lafayette Station in Jersey City with almost no notification to the public or public officials. The reason giving, given was that it was security reasons, that it was not safe. Well, the community became upset, very upset. They had a demonstration in front of the main post office of Jersey City. They responded by putting a mobile station where the post office was. A few weeks later, again, the mobile station was removed. No reason giving other than security. And there was very little notification to the community. Closing all the post office was hard on seniors, which uh, around this particular post office. I, be, I, be, I, I was able to involve the other two members of Congress, plus the two senators in this post office closing. Very little information came forward from the Postal Service regarding the reason why this post office was closing. And when you think of two senators and three congressmen not getting information, to me, that's just not the way it's supposed to be. I don't think even the president could have saved this post office. But to me, it showed a lack of compassion and a lack of sensitivity to communities. And we finally, after many, many months, find out why the reason of the closing of the post office of this particular post office, and it was financial. This is the reason why I introduced my bill. Basically, the bill limits the effect of financial reason on closing of the post office. It doesn't eliminate it, but it's not the main reason for closing the post office. And eliminates the dual system and makes one unified closing process. Right now, if you have a main post office, there's a process established by Congress for the main post office, but the satellite offices, uh, post office, they can close at any time without any reasons. I'm not an expert on post office, but I know at least in the urban area, I don't know outside the urban areas and outside suburban areas, but usually you have one main post office with many satellite post offices. What this bill does, it increases the notification to the public. And it extends the public comment to, from 60 to 90 days. It is my hope that to make the closing transparent and inform the people that are going to be affected by the closing of the post office. I have more than 80 members that have signed on to this post uh, office bill, and I do hope that in the hearings that you have in the future, that you recognize that finances are important. But I think community, what it does to an area, access to people who do not have the ability to drive, seniors, that you take all those in consideration. Because like it was stated here before, in the Constitution, it does state that this is one of the services that we have to provide. So I thank you for allowing me to testify here today, and I do hope that in the end, we can make this postal service a little more responsive. Thank you very much. I thank the gentleman. Uh, do any members have any questions for Mr. Sears? Does he have time? Is he actually can he stay? Um, you can ask him if you want. Yeah. Thank you. I, I appreciate it. We, we were talking about this before. It, it, 
Do you see, the, uh, how can we distinguish the difference between the urban components and the rural components? I mean, this is a real concern. They, they both have issues, but they're both different issues. How, how, do you, how do you see us addressing that? Congressman, I have to admit, I'm an urban person. <laughs> I, live <in> the <laughs> I live in a community that is one square mile. I have 50,000 people in my community. You know, I love to sit down with someone that is not an urban person and talk about these So, so just, just addressing the urban component, what, what, are, what are the issues that, I mean, there, you talk about in general in the bill about there are community issues, there are the elderly, you have a large elderly component. What, kind of list out on top of your mind what, what those issues are that you have to deal with in the urban component. Well, it's access. Seniors do not have ability to walk a mile away in the city of Jersey City to deal with the post office. Seniors do not use computers. Seniors do not have computers. Seniors that I deal with can barely pay the electric, electric bill. So basically it's access to the postal services, which I'm sure that is also in, 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 in your areas. And, and, and this is the main concern that many of the, uh, the people in the area. Plus the fact that it was just closed from one day to the next. That is, you know, there was no plan other than say, well, there's a post office a mile away, deal with that post office. Um, do, do we need some sort of, I mean, how, how are we ultimately going to make these decisions? I mean, I, my guess is if you were to ask all 435 members of Congress, nobody wants to have a, a post office closed in their district, but yet clearly we've got to do some sort of a consolidation. Certainly there are some criteria by which uh, we need to consolidate some of the facilities, and the number may or may not be right. Uh, what are those criteria? I mean, how are we ultimately going to come to that decision? Should it be a BRAC-like process? Should we're, we're, uh, well, how do you see this I don't happening? think that's such a bad idea, something like that. Or in terms of what else can we do for the post office, whether we have to, uh, I, I know you don't believe in giving them more money, but if this is a service that it must be provided, I'm not opposed to that. Well, I actually think there's probably more justification no. for uh, using uh, federal funds to uh, help fund the, the, the Postal Service, given its constitutional designation, than probably most every other thing that we do within this government. So um, I, I, I'm not necessarily out of hand, just opposed to, to supplementing what, what's happening there. Well, so. I'm, you know, I agree with you on that issue. Specifically about that, that review process, um, that open comment process, how, how do you see that happening? Because, you know, the difference between 30 days or 60 days or 60 days to 90 days, if the process itself doesn't allow for the dialogue to happen and true consideration of maybe some of the other factors that go into how important that post office is in that community, help me understand how that, how that process should work in, in your viewpoint. Well, in my viewpoint, there should be notification through the newspapers that this is taking place. There should be the local uh, uh, elected officials should be informed that this is happening. Um, I think that there should be uh, some sort of uh, announcement by the post office long before that. Uh, the reason I extended it to 90 days is to get more participation in this process. Uh, to me, it's just plain wrong to go in there and close the post office, not Mike, give any reason why. I mean, there's got to be a better reason than just finances to close the post office. And, and, and that's what I try to do with this bill. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll yield back. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, just claiming a, a few minutes of time, I, I do as well represent uh, an urban district, mostly urban, although I have a suburban I have 19 towns that are more suburban in nature, but I represent a significant part of the city of Boston and the city of Brockton, which are clearly urban. Uh, <clears throat> and I, I just, uh, just want to say I agree with the gentleman's observation that uh, these post offices and stations and branches are intensely local institutions. They are not only commercial centers, they're also social centers. And I think we remember that, that uh, when we ask the general public to grade uh, public employees, 
they consistently grade their postal workers, their mail handlers, their letter carriers, uh, postal supervisors and postmasters the highest of any public employee. So those relationships between the communities and, and the post office at that local level is intensely personal. And when we see the disruption that's created by a closing, uh, it has very real and dramatic impact on the people that we represent. So it, it creates a real dilemma for us. And we need to figure out a way to be able to guide the community when something like this has to happen. Uh, someone once said, uh, there's nothing more disruptive to the human condition than the power of a new idea. People just hate change. And uh, unfortunately, we've seen 9 billion pieces of mail taken out of the system last year, 23 billion projected out of the system this year. Uh, because of the economy and people moving to electronic media, like email and, and electronic payment systems. Uh, we clearly have to reconcile our revenues with, with the size of our system. And so that's going to be a very delicate process. I do agree with the gentleman that that whole process needs to be more inclusive with the community and with the representatives who, who are responsible uh, for those areas. And, uh, you know, that's, that's our task. That's part of the responsibility of this hearing, and we really appreciate your, your bill. I, I do have to say that uh, I don't know where the post office turns if they can't uh, right-size their system based on cost. It leaves them with very little opportunity. They've got very limited uh, power right now, very limited flexibility. And, unless, and this is a challenge not for the post office alone. It's for all of us. It's for the employees. Uh, for the unions, it's, it's, uh, our task is to preserve uh, high quality, affordable, universal service to the Postal Service. And we need to, to bring the post office into the next, uh, you know, the next century, the next iteration, and to compete with all of these, these new technologies. So we've got a task here of preserving that, otherwise uh, it'll, it'll I mean, we're going to have a big bailout, and I don't know if the, if the nation and, and, and the, the taxpayer are, are going to entertain a, another bailout, this time for the post office. Uh, and I, I'm just very leery about uh, the changes that, that collapse. We are on the verge of a, a somewhat of a collapse here in terms of the funding mechanism, of what that might bring. It might bring a lot of changes that none of us, none of the customer, the unions, the users, the mailers, uh, none of us want. And uh, I just don't want to see us, uh, by, by default, allow the economic forces to define what the Postal Service will look like in the future. Mr. Chair, chair recognizes the gentleman from Northern Virginia, Mr. Connolly. I thank the Chair. Uh, Mr. Sirius, uh, your bill, as I understand it, does not preclude the closing of branch post offices, it addresses the need for notification to the community and elected officials. Is that correct? Yes, and that financial reason is not the only reason for closing a post office. So it requires some proffer of the rationale for why the consolidation. Yes. But in and of itself, your bill does not preclude the contemplation no. of such kinds of does your bill also address the issue of changing the hours of operation? No. Let me just suggest to you that certainly in my urban area, that's as much an issue as how many branches there may or may not be. Particularly with long commutes, evening hours are very important for people to access postal services and to do their business. And I, I would just suggest to you that we may want to think about adding that to the notification procedures to local officials in the community. Uh, it may or may not be necessary, but to do it without any notification is terribly disruptive uh, and has impacts that start to rival those of closure itself. Thank you, Congressman Connolly. Mr. Chairman, I certainly agree with all the comments that you said. And I'll just end by saying that this is now my first encounter with the post office. I couldn't even get response from the Postal Service when they remove a mailbox in Elizabeth, New Jersey. 
I'll end it with that. Thank you very much. You need much. to call me then. <laughs> when you have problems like that, you need to call me. That's, that's unacceptable. I'm looking for responsiveness. I'm looking for sensitivity. I'm looking for some sort of compassion from the Postal Service. Let, let me just say that, you know, I, I think what the gentleman is looking for here uh, is, is notice so that he's able to represent the people who elected him, which is a very basic right and, and, and obligation, a right in terms of the people to be represented and an obligation on the gentleman to, to do his job. Uh, but to do that, he needs notice. And he needs to know what the, what the rationale, the reasoning is for uh, any proposed closing. Uh, he needs a fair opportunity to address that. He needs to know what the factors are that have been placed behind this decision. And he needs to have and the people that he represents need to have a part in this process so that essential services are not eliminated and that the employees here, the letter carriers, the mail handlers, the clerks, the postal supervisors and, and postmasters are treated fairly during this process. And they're not just uh, blindsided by, by this. And I, I actually think if, if that type of conduct were to be the norm that you experienced, it, it would stop. It would basically stop any changes because we, we can't have it done that way. And, and that, simply, uh, that simply cannot be tolerated. But I want to thank the gentleman for offering his thoughtful legislation. Uh, and oh, the chair recognizes the gentleman from California, Mr. Bill Bright. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I know you want to move on, but I just have some uh, uh, questions for the author. When you talk about notification of the paper, you're not talking about legal advertisement, are you? Yes. Congressman, how many of your constituents, you know, I, I know there are some that do that, but wouldn't a news release, a media communication that ends up somewhere on the front page or on one of the pages that people read, um, be so much better way of informing the public than putting it back and basically, and, and let's face it, it is a financing, financial situation for papers to put it in the legal, the legal notifications. But I'll tell you something, being a mayor, being a county working out, I just found that legal notifications were the worst way to notify the public of anything. Well, I was a mayor for 12 years. I know exactly what you're talking about. But I still say that that's just not the only reason through the news to inform the public. There are some type of ads that are not as expensive, but I think it gets the message, at least, in, in, you know, in, in what I experience. Well, wouldn't you find out that in most communities where the, where the media was directly um, notified that, look, we're considering closing the local post office, that that would not carry enough of a sto story to be able to allow the public to know that the media would respond to that kind of notice? Sure, the media will respond, but that's a one-day story, maybe a two-day story. But how do you follow it up? To, okay. you give me I, I just have a, I still say that I just think that it's fine if you want to do you want to do an, a, a legal notice, but the fact is the public doesn't read legal notices. That's a that's a way I, we finance I, banks. I mean, I mean, uh, uh, papers, and I know papers are the next crisis that we're all talking about. Yeah. I don't necessarily mean the legal notice that you're talking about, the small section in the back, but there are other ways of noticing it. Okay. And your issue of it shall not be solely for finance, what, what other conditions would be required to close, to close the station? You know, I, I think of Mr. Connolly's, um, in fact, I know he's already got his memorial post office picked out there at Mount Vernon, which is a trailer. Um, yeah. And I assume Mount Vernon makes money for the Postal Service because it's, it's you know, it, it's right there at Mount Vernon. But what is the other conditions that would be required under your bill before they can close it? Well, my particular district, not other districts, I have four senior citizens around this post office, large senior citizen buildings. They need access to the post office. Basically, they come down, they walk a block, two, and they are at the post office. That could be a consideration, access to the most needy. Also, you have, you know, uh, People doing business, small businesses, mom and pop shops that need some of this uh, post office nearby. Time is money. But you haven't enumerated examples of what in your bill would also be required besides the financial. You just basically say financial cannot be the no, sole. The, the I'm just, 
I'm, uh, there is a bill already in Congress that takes in consideration a number of issues before closing the post office. I just don't want, in my bill, the, the financial aspect to be the only aspect. The, the other ones that are in the bill are fine also. Okay. Thank you. You're back, Mr. Chairman. I thank the General Weed. Thank you for your, your thoughtful testimony and for coming forward and helping the committee with its work. And we, we appreciate uh, there, there may be questions for you from other members who aren't here right now, and we'll just ask you Fine. to uh, respond to those in writing. I want to thank you, Chairman. I want to thank all the members. Thank you very much for your interest. Thank you. Chair, we now welcome the second panel. Yeah. 